I have to confess, I'm not coming at this from the direction of art. Uh, I was, uh, my initial uh, motivation had more to do with accessing information that had been distributed in the form of CD-ROM. Some of it was programs as well as other kinds of data. Uh, and it's been really quite an eye-opener to see the range of issues that affect art that are beyond the kinds of things that I've really focused on. So I, I hope I can give you an idea about uh, what we've been able to do with uh, large scale, when I say large scale, large numbers of things that we've preserved through not just emulation technology, but also uh, just uh, pr preserving CD-ROMs. Some CD-ROMs are really just data. Um, let's see. How does this work? Oh, okay. So just a little bit of motivation uh, of the sort of things I'm thinking about today that are not so much art, although this affects art. Um, Many of the archives are starting to get the papers of artists or writers, or for example, um, in this case, Emery was given the, uh, the working uh, computers of Salman Rushdie, which they then had the problem of preserving, and in, in fact, they've used emulation to do that. And it introduces certain issues that are different than the art community. One of those issues is just security of access to the materials. They can't just put Salman Rushdie's materials on the web. They can't just allow unfettered access to them. They have to, they have to preserve access to them. But they have many of the same problems that you have in that uh, in order to access the materials that were part of his creative process, they have to be able to run or access the old software that ran on these Macintoshes to look at these things. So this is just a little bit of motivation. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of, um, well, this is sort of their record. It's not that interesting. It just says what it, what it is. Uh, of the kinds of things I've looked at over time. This was, this was um, a CD-ROM that was one of the first things I, I looked at. It was actually suggested to me by a historian. Uh, many of you may remember, I don't know, that H.R. Halderman was um, Richard Nixon's chief of staff at the time of Watergate. And, um, and the historian, I, I met a historian at dinner, and he was very aggravated because the CD-ROM, which was the diaries of H.R. Halderman, which from a historical perspective are quite important, were really only ever published in CD-ROM form, and they were no longer accessible. They didn't run on modern versions of Windows. And it turned out a little, a little bit later, well, much later, when, um, uh, when um, Deep Throat, who was the leak in Watergate, this is the person who leaked all the information that led to Richard Nixon's downfall, was revealed, the only parts of Halderman's diary that referred to him were only accessible through the CD-ROM or through the original, because the diaries were never published in the unabridged form. So it's a, just an indicator of how things can come back where you really need to get access to some old materials. As it turned out, we were able to get this to run uh, on more modern versions of Windows through emulation. And, and, and speaking of plugins, this is one that depended upon a plugin, a QuickTime plugin that was no longer available. It was actually quite hard to find one that would work with it. Uh, yes. Sure. So the, the basic idea of emulation is a platform that behaves like the original computer and behave is subject to interpretation in which you run the original operating system and you run the original software on top of that operating system. It's no longer the hardware, but it's a software representation of the computer. Now this is used a lot uh, in, and you've probably heard of virtualization. Virtualization is basically uh, emulation with uh, accelerated hardware and it's used in the cloud a lot now. So if you're in the position of needing to run old uh, versions of Windows, you're in good shape because every machine supports emulation of old Windows in, in a sense. With Macintosh, the life got, gets more complicated and with machines that were not even as common as Macintosh, it gets even more complicated. This is, this is one we discussed a little bit yesterday in the question period. This was um, the um, uh, mouse, uh, sort of the uh, annotated mouse. Mouse was this uh, graphic novel uh, that Art Spiegelman uh, designed. And he won the Pulitzer Prize. And there was an exhibit at, at, I don't know if it was MoMA, but a major exhibit of his art and of the creative process. And he made this. Um, CD-ROM version, which somebody told me has now been reissued. And what was interesting about it was the ability to go through the entire book and see early versions of the drawings, as well as to see uh, 
to hear him speak about the drawings and hear the interviews he had with his father. This was uh, based upon his father's experience as a, as a concentration camp prisoner. And so this, again, was one of these ones that uh, has some lasting value. It's, not, it's, it's really about art rather than art, but it has lasting value. There's a good reason to want to see the old version, and yet you're cut off from it because you can't run the original uh, software. Um, let's see how much time I have here. I was going to run, I, I'll, I'll show you a little video of this just to give you a sense of, of what's, what's going on, if I can find the. I just have a, a video of running it, a piece of it, just to give you a sense of what it's all about. Let's see. I don't know if it's running. Let's see if I can find the scroll bar that shows you where it runs. I just want to run it. Just, uh, okay. So it has this kind of uh, uh, menu where you can go and look at the book, you can listen to him speak, you'll hear a little bit of the introduction if you wish. Um, it flips through the various pictures, really there's some, some kind of interesting things here, so this is all background, shows you early hold. drawings of... Every uh, picture in the Louvre, uh, zillions of things, and that I thought would become a repository for the thousands of sketches, hundreds of pages of notes, hours and hours of tape, and all of that stuff in one nice little box. I was disillusioned to find the technology isn't that far advanced finally, but remained interested in the idea that it could become an indicator of the various layers that are involved in making mouse. A couple of years ago, I had a show at the Museum of Modern Art, and it was able to show that process and make certain things clear. And I felt this might allow for a portable version that anybody could have of that kind of material. That's enough of probably of that, but uh, actually that gets to the thing I, that we discussed yesterday, which was that CD-ROM technology was unfortunately uh, a bit more limiting than, um, than anybody anticipated at the time. I want to get out a quick time player. There we go, back to the slides. So, um, there were no, a number of these things. In fact, one of the things I looked at was uh, the CD-ROMs published by the Voyager companies, which we'll talk about a little bit here. So I want to first talk about uh, virtualizing a collection, where the idea was to capture uh, all the digital contents of large numbers of CD-ROMs and make them uh, accessible, and then a little bit about a, a, a emulation as uh, a process for making some of those available. So the first thing we did was uh, look at the CD-ROM collections of my libraries. And it turns out in the United States, the government printing office, which is the printing arm of the United States government, for about 15 years, they basically published everything on CD-ROM rather than paper. So they published uh, on the order of 5,000 CD-ROMs. And some of these are just rather boring documents, and some of them are quite interesting. So for example, when we put this up, I'd get these emails from the Apollo freaks, uh, the, 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 the guys who are really interested in the Apollo missions, because some of these things had early documents about the Apollo mission that weren't ordinarily accessible. So this is really just about making information accessible, but our initial goal was quite modest, which was to take all these CD-ROMs and somehow make them available on the web so you could browse them, you could download the images, you could play them, you could do all these different things with the CD-ROMs that were difficult even in the library collection. And those things are all now available. And the model we kind of had of a collection, which is, seems a little quaint now, was the idea that you would have um, not just the, the bits that correspond to the image, but you might have additional materials. You'll have the bits, you might have the things that are necessary to make those bits run, you might have an emulation environment that you could execute. At the same time, you could browse these, the contents to see if you're interested in what was on them. Um, and so our basic approach at that time was a kind of a mixture of uh, a client-based approach with the web server providing most of the content. Here we have, you know, this is what we did about uh, six or eight years ago. We had a web server with the normal kinds of uh, 
scripts to, to allow access. And then we had, on a separate domain, we had the actual bits were accessible. And the reason we used um, a separate file system is we had to have, uh, many of these things were copyright protected, so we had to have some access mechanism to allow uh, uh, checking of users. And then we had things running on the client that would then access these two things in common. They could access the, the web server, they could access the, the emulation environments and execute them on the host work, workstation. And to get to the question about emulation, the idea is the host would have some kind of emulation platform which had the guest operating system and had uh, a basic way to interact with these different things. And, and one thing here is we had on the file server sort of uh, scripts to set up the emulation environment for a specific instance. And um, I don't know if I have time to talk about that in great detail, but I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, what, one of the things we looked at a great deal was what I call on-the-fly customization. When you have a few things to preserve, preserving the software environment is okay. You can preserve a separate disk drive image for each of the different environments. But when you're talking about thousands of things, you may not want to have thousands of multi-gigabyte hard drive images laying around in order to access these thousands of things. So the idea that we had was we start with sort of a base environment and then when somebody wished to access something, we would customize that environment on the fly, install whatever software was necessary into that environment and bring up a working image of the environment to run this. Many of these, um, as you heard, there are plugins and things, many of these CD-ROMs require specific software, not always compatible software. It's not like there is a single base image that you could set up that would run them all. So, for example, in the government documents, there were things that had dependencies on old versions of Office, particular old versions of Office, for example. They might use some of the scripting capabilities of old versions of Office. You couldn't just install the latest version and have at it. You couldn't install the oldest version and have that work. You really had to generate an environment on the fly that somebody could use. And so we did a fairly large experiment. We took you know, on the order of 1,300 CD-ROMs that needed some kind of installation. And then we did a project in which we looked at what all those things needed and how we might script this process of customization. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, well, here's a, here's a note on why this idea of assistant emulation made sense. If you, if you think of a Windows environment, the base image is on the order of four to eight gigabytes. And if you have 1,300 things, you're starting to talk real, real storage for these things. Furthermore, uh, you, in order to run them, you need to, uh, or Klaus, Klaus will talk about emulation as a service, but at that time we were thinking emulation on the platform, you need to be able to download all these things and execute them. That's a fairly large startup cost to download gigabytes of things before you get going. So what we wanted was that you could have a, a, a basic environment and that relatively quickly that could be brought up to an executing environment that would run on your workstation. And it turned out the amount of material that had to be installed was modest compared to that four to eight gigabyte thing. So we, we organized the, the archive materials in this way in which we had the thing we wanted to look at, the sort of additional software we needed, some way to do the install through uh, of this customized software environment to, to bring up a, a unique customized uh, execution environment at the time we wanted to run it. So uh, I'll skip this slide for lack of time, but the idea was that a user would get some kind of user interface and ask to see something, some kind of emulation assistant and uh, some kind of base machine and it would start up this world in which it installed everything they needed. And here's an example of what was going on in this emulation assistant. It would, it, it would uh, find out what it needed. It would pull down the image that you wanted to look at. It would run some kind of install scripts, connect to start up a, a, a virtual machine to run this environment, run the uh, install script, which turns out to be uh, a little harder than we thought initialization uh, initially, and then get the whole thing up and running uh, get you to an environment in which the CD-ROM that you wanted to look at was installed along with the software and you could execute it. Uh, the scripting process, uh, the install process, surprisingly, the, uh, with Windows, you often have to do very complicated things like uh, restart the machine several times in order to do the install. So the, the whole scripting process had to deal with this fact that uh, 
it wasn't just simply copying some software over. It had to run scripts. It had to restart the machine. It had to do all kinds of fairly complicated things or, or to make a go of it. Uh, so, you know, if it was only something simple like a PDF, it might just install ac the, a reasonable version of Acrobat. Not all versions of Acrobat are created equal, so it would have to install one that was appropriate. But, um, it, um, but for my comp more complicated things, you might have to install uh, language support. So, for example, you might need uh, Asian languages. Uh, it's not something we usually think about with art, but with information, with the things libraries have, there are quite a few uh, things that they hold that have dependencies on, uh, say, uh, Chinese fonts, just as an example, and you have to install those. So we looked at this quite a lot, and, and this slide uh, gives you a few of the kinds of things we ran into, uh, things like uh, having to change the language, having to restart the computer to do an install, having to install a, a version of Java, having to configure memory, having to configure, if you're going to run old versions, software that depend on older versions of Windows, compatibility modes. There were uh, quite a few little steps that went through, but after we went through this 1,300 of these things, it became clear there were some commonality, there were some standard things, and, and the scripting process got a lot faster. I, in fact, hired undergrads to do this work. So here was a, just a simple script, uh, you know, running some sort of setup, waiting for things to complete, uh, bringing up some, uh, uh, some control uh, messages and, and pushing the button, automatically pushing the button. Fortunately, in the Windows environment, there were things that were developed to allow this kind of scripting because of the need for uh, system staff to be able to maintain them anyway. So this didn't have to, we didn't have to develop new scripting technology. We had to apply it in this instance to create these uh, custom environments. So we kept data. To give you a sense of how long it took, Here's the number of scripts, it's a histogram of how long it took to develop the script versus how many there were. And most of them were really quite short and there were a few outliers that required uh, real, real thought or tracking down very difficult to install pieces of software or just dealing with issues that hadn't come up before. But in general, uh, it turned out that the cost of doing this on the fly customization in terms of building an environment wasn't outrageous. Uh, there are certainly some things that uh, were difficult to solve. And a similar graph that shows you, you know, how much code went into this customization. And, and there's only a handful that really had substantial amounts of scripting code to make it work, and most of them were really quite modest. And often there were things that were repeated, so there were sort of uh, subroutines that were cr created for doing certain tasks that came up again and again. Um, so that was the Windows environment. In the, in the Macintosh environment, we, we took a different tack. The, the size of the disk drive images you need is a lot smaller. Um, and the amount of customization you need is a lot less. The Mac Macintosh environment was actually a much more cohesive ecosystem than the Windows environment. But uh, it turns out that there were, there were problems uh, that had to do more with the emulation environment, and, and uh, Klaus will tell you some of those things. I'll tell you a little bit about today, but uh, so we looked at a collection of uh, CD-ROMs that were created in their early 90s uh, by the Voyager company, which was quite a uh, progressive company in terms of thinking about how CD-ROM technology might be used, and they did this mouse CD, and they did a bunch of art CDs, and they did books, they, did all kind of, they tried everything, basically. Um, it turns out that there, in the Mac world, there aren't commercial emulators, uh, unlike the, the PC world where there's this whole virtualization uh, ecosystem developing. In the Mac world, you have basically software written by hobbyists. There are two major ones, Sheepshaver and Bas Basilisk, which are related. And uh, they're somewhat fragile, and they're, they're not well supported anymore. And also in the Mac world, you depend upon access to the ROMs that were in the original machines, and while people have made images of them, it's not clear that there's any legal right to use any of them. Even there's some later that were distributed with the Mac OS on the CD. It's not even obvious you're allowed to use them. So there's some legal issues associated with that, which I'm not going to talk about anymore. So the Voyager publications, they're on the, it's hard to know the exact number, on the order of 75 to 100 unique publications. Um, 
I, I, Mouse was an example. There was uh, interactive Beethoven's Fifth, which was an interesting experiment in how you present music along with interactive capabilities to search through the music and, and learn about the themes. There were things like uh, Laurie Anderson, who was a performance artist, did this kind of strange game called Puppet Motel. There, there are quite a few. Uh, curious and interesting things. And I was able to track down a large number of them on the order of uh, 50. Um, so Beethoven's Ninth, how much time do I have left? I'm still good? Okay. Beethoven's Ninth, ninth was an early, uh, early CD-ROM that was interactive. It was from 1989. And you could play the Ninth Symphony, but you could also um, skip to various sections. You could look at the actual score. It would talk about how uh, the harmonies worked. And so it was a very interesting thing for um, exploring this music. And it also uh, turned out it was a, a, one of a modest number of CDs that were considered hybrid. They had both audio components and they had data components. And this turned out to be a problem with emulation for the Macintosh and in fact for anything because hybrid CDs really aren't supported by any emulator. Um, uh, another one uh, was a, a, a photograph collection by Pedro Meyer, which is now available on the web, uh, called I Photograph to Remember. And what it was was pictures of his family and the history of his family along with uh, narration. And this was another hybrid uh, CD. And the mouse one I talked about. All these were hybrid CDs. Laurie Anderson's Puppet Motel. I'm, r I'm running out of time, so I want to skip over to get to some of the more interesting things. So uh, let me just skip to something important here. So the hybrid CDs required modifying the emulator. And you probably find that with art, with some of the things with, with preserving digital art, that the emulator as given isn't really up to the task. That, that somehow at the technical level, you're going to have to change it to support things. It's not just that you don't have the software. It's that the software depended on things that the emulator designer didn't really anticipate because it wasn't the norm. Um, Fortunately, in this case of Macintosh, the architecture of the emulator allows this fairly readily. It has a, a model in which uh, the, the Macintosh, the model of the de device drivers was that they could all be replaced. There was a sort of a, a basic uh, set of generic device drivers to access the hardware, and when they wrote uh, Sheep Shaver, what they did is sort of overwrote all those device drivers with device drivers that trapped out to the user level, and you could you could replace them with uh, functional equivalents. And that's the only thing that's really made it possible to emulate the Macintosh effectively, is that because the way the operating system was designed. So we took advantage of that. Uh, we also um, took advantage of, uh, we used that in, in a sense to replace the CD-ROM support by something that could support these hybrid CD-ROMs. Uh, hooking into the low-level audio device driver to make this uh, audio stuff work. Um, I don't want to talk about that. Let me move on and tell you what we're up to now. Well, here's a little slide that shows you sort of our experiment with all these different CD-ROMs. And in fact, we were able to, uh, you shouldn't really read this except to say that there's a lot of them <laughs> arranged by date. And then there were some various things we checked like what kinds of support they required, whether they ran effectively, those kinds of things. If somebody's interested, I can point you to a paper that actually has all these details. But the idea is that uh, the window of lifetime of this whole thing was only about six years. The whole CD-ROM thing, six years later, Voyager was pretty much dead as a company. And I think that the whole lifetime of CD-ROMs as a distribution medium maybe is 10 years. And, um, and over that period of uh, six or seven years that Voyager was in business, they went through a few technologies, but it's, even though there's a wide diversity of the kinds of things that were done, there's not an enormous diversity in the technical requirements of those things. There's a handful of things that once you've solved those problems, you've solved them for a large number of other things. Um, Sheep Saver, I want to skip over. So here's where we're headed. I'm interested in um, the following model, and I'll end with this. When you're dealing with uh, protected materials, that is, the life work of somebody, you would like to allow as many people as possible to see them, but you don't necessarily want to release them on the web in a way that people can copy them however they like. So where, where we're headed is a model in which somebody can run an emulator who's approved to run it, whatever that means, 
without actually ever having access to the bits. Now, of course, they could take screenshots. They can do all the things you can do to copy now with, if you're running something on a computer, but they never have access to the protected bits, that those would be somehow maintained securely. Whether the, whether the uh, emulator is running on their desktop or running in a web server uh, in, a, in a cloud, as, as Klaus's work is doing, the idea is simply that if you imagine a generic system, we have a, the viewing station, we have the emulator running on some host operating system, we have a file system accessing the, the disk image and, other, and the artifact itself, our goal is something like this, that the, you have a trusted execution environment. Anything that it keeps locally would be encrypted. Its access to the remote things would be encrypted as well. And we, we don't want, other than the ability to take screenshots, potentially to leak the information. We don't want to provide unfettered access. We want controlled access. This is what, this is what an archive needs. Now, this may or may not be in a person's home. It might be in a partner institution. So Emory, quite rightly, I'll end on this point, Emory quite rightly is sensitive about Salman Rushdie's materials and they want to control access like many archives do. But imagine that they could partner with other university libraries that would agree to certain terms on what control means and then that you could run the emulator remotely at that institution and access it as if you were at Emory. So you, you in a sense, have a partner in your security model. Um, you still have this issue that they don't want the bits to leak. They still want to control the bits. And so our interest is in uh, making that possible to go that next step in uh, being able to deliver emulators where you as a provider can guarantee they're not violating copyright because you're not giving them the bits to say the ROMs or the operating system or you can guarantee you're meeting the requirements of your patrons, of your, of your um, donors by not leaking their raw materials out to the web. Um, so uh, lots of preservation issues. I have to end with this acknowledgement. Um, this work was funded by National Science Foundation and um, I spent a couple years there until recently and so they also allowed me to continue my research while I was there, although that was subject to not having a whole lot of time. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>